Hi, this is Estelle Trengove. This is a lecture on current, power, and the basic elements that we're going to use in the first part of the electric circuits course. The issue of polarity is dealt with in another lecture clip. Current can flow in conductive material because conductive material has free electrons that are free to move from atom to atom. So the free electrons, for example, in this drawing, the electron in the outer orbit of this atom is free to jump to a hole in a nearby atom and then it can keep on moving into a hole in the orbit of another nearby atom. So you can see that the movement of the electrons is in this direction, but the movement of the holes is in this direction. And ironically, conventional current is not defined as the direction in which the electrons move. It is defined as the direction in which the holes move. Current is the rate of change of charge at a particular point in a circuit. So we use the symbol Q to denote charge and it is measured in coulombs and it is the rate of change of charge at a particular point at a particular time and time is measured in seconds so current is the rate of change of charge per unit time and that is measured in amperes or amps, which is denoted by a capital letter A. The separation of positive and negative charge leads to a force, and this force is called voltage. Voltage is the energy that is needed to move a unit charge from one point to another. So you can see that voltage is the work needed in joules per unit charge and this gives us volts which we denote with a capital letter V. So it's important to note that voltage causes current to flow and voltage is also called a potential difference. So voltage is measured between two points because it measures the potential difference between the two points. There are two different symbols for resistors, this one and this one, and I will use them interchangeably. A uh, resistor is a conductive element that is, allows current to pass through it, and while current is passing through that element, it absorbs power. Resistance is written as an R, and it is a function of the resistivity of the material times the length of the resistor and it's inversely proportional to the area of the resistor. So the area is the cross-sectional area of the resistor. The length is the length of the resistor. And the resistivity is associated with the material that the resistor is made of. The resistor the resistivity has units of meter ohms and the lower the resistivity, the better a conductor the material is. So, for example, iron would have a much lower resistivity than wood, for example. 
Next, we will look at the ideal independent current source. An ideal independent current source maintains a constant current through the terminals that it is attached to, um, irrespective of what is attached to it. So it maintains a cons constant current irrespective of the voltage drawn by the circuit. So if we had to plot the curve of that current versus time, so let's say this is a 5 amp current, then irrespective of how long that current source was connected to the circuit, it would always produce 5 amps. And this is the current. And also, irrespective of the voltage drawn, so if we plot voltage on this axis and current on this axis, that current source will produce 5 amps, irrespective of how much voltage is drawn by the circuit. Let's just take a look for a moment. So we're going to denote current with the letter I. In this case, I1, I1 is the same as the current shown flowing from the current source. So I1 is equal to 5 amps. What if we had... A current of minus 5 amps flowing here. Then, in this case, I2 would be equal to minus 5 amps. But for me, I like working with positive numbers, so I would prefer to redraw this like this. So now you can see that in this circuit a current of minus 5 amp flowing in this direction is exactly the same as a current of 5 amps flowing in this direction. So it means that these two circuits these two drawings are exactly the same. What if we had a current of 5 amps flowing in this direction and we defined I3 like this? What would I3 be then? Well, I3 has been defined in the opposite direction to the current flowing from the current source. So in this case, I3 would be equal to minus 5 amps. For the ideal independent voltage source, we have different symbols to represent ideal independent voltage sources. So this one here with a little sine wave, that is the symbol that we use for an alternating current voltage source. Or an AC voltage source. These two symbols we use to denote a DC voltage source. or a direct current voltage source. And in fact, this voltage source over here, this drawing is usually used to denote a battery. And just like for the ideal independent current source, it produces that voltage across its terminal irrespective of what is connected to it and for how long it's connected. So if we plot it against time, the ideal independent voltage source will produce the same voltage irrespective of how much time passes. And if we plot it against current, 
it will produce a constant voltage irrespective of how much current is drawn by the circuit and of course if it's an AC source it will produce a constant sine wave irrespective of what is connected to it. But that brings me to some more important um, jargon. So if we look at the AC source which typically produces a sine wave then some other important terminology to know okay so this is a voltage and this is time let's say that this is at 4 volts and this is at minus 4 volts then it's important to note that this voltage is called the peak voltage V peak and that is equal to 4 volts in this case but the voltage from here to here that is called V peak to peak the peak to peak voltage and V peak to peak is equal to 8 volts because we measure it from the one peak of the sine wave to the next to the valley of the sine wave. Regarding polarity it's similar to what we saw with the ideal independent current source so if you have a voltage that's drawn like this and that is minus 6 volts then that is equivalent to drawing it like this you turn you flip the signs around and then you can also change the sign of the voltage so this is 6 volts and the polarity of the voltage source has been changed around and it just is easier when you do more complex analyses to work with positive numbers so it's less confusing. Note that the ideal independent voltage source and the ideal independent current source is just a useful model for what we see happening in circuits. So sometimes our model can break down. For example, if we have a circuit where we have a current source producing a current of, let's say, 5 amps, and we've got another current source producing a current of 3 amps. Remember that our definition of an ideal current source said that it produces the same current irrespective of what is connected to it. So we can see that our model breaks down in this case because that current source can, it can either only produce 5 amps or 3 amps, but the two together is a contradiction. Um, similarly, if we have an open circuit, with the 5 amp source connected to it, in an open circuit, no current can flow, so I should be equal to zero. Um, and our model breaks down if we connect a current source to an open circuit. And in the same way, if we have a resistor and we connect a voltage source to it of 6 volts, and on this side we connect a voltage source of 9 volts to it, our definition of an ideal independent voltage source says that the voltage source has to maintain the same voltage between these two terminals and so our model breaks down if we connect two voltage sources between the two same terminals.
And what would happen in practice is that something would probably break. Next we get to Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law is the most basic thing that you need to know and everything that we're going to learn in circuits basically builds on Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law states that the voltage across a resistor is proportional to the current through it. Note that we are assuming ideal resistors that don't that, that their resistivity doesn't change as temperature changes. So V is equal to IR and that is the statement of Ohm's law. So we can see that the voltage is proportional to the current through a resistor. There are two special circuit conditions. The first one is if we have, let's say we have a 10 volt voltage source, we have a resistor of R, ohms, then this piece here is a short circuit. So even if we connect another resistor across here, so we'll call that one R1 and we'll call this one R2, then the current will prefer to flow through the paths of least resistance. So if we have a current I, all of that current is going to flow through here. And let's call this I dashed. That's going to be equal to zero. And the voltage across a short circuit is zero volts. So for a short circuit, V is equal to zero. Let's call it V out. The out is going to be zero volts. The other special circuit condition is an open circuit. So if we have a voltage source and we have a resistor, R. Then if there's a gap in the circuit, like this gap over here, that's an open source. And we can say that for an open source, the resistance of the open source the resistance of an open source tends to infinity. In this case, our short circuit t is equal to zero. So the resistance of a short circuit is zero. The resistance of an open circuit um, tends to infinity. Sorry, that should say circuit. Um, and no current can flow if there's an open circuit. So I will be equal to zero. And that means that the volt drop across the resistor due to Ohm's law is also equal to zero volt. So the whole voltage of 10 volts is going to drop across these two terminals. So if we call this V out... 2, then V out 2 is equal to 10 volts.